So today let's explore a switching power supply from a microwave oven, donated by a viewer, so big thanks for the donation and... To this day switching power supplies in microwave ovens are sort of rare. Most microwave ovens are still using an iron transformer to power the magnetron. And the microwave magnetron requires basically two voltages for its operation. The heater voltage which is typically 3.15 volts or 3.3 volts for the heater which comes from these wires, the heater secondary, and 4 kilovolts for the anode. And of course the anode is grounded, so in reality it uses negative 4 kilovolts applied to the directly heated cathode. And the main secondary of this transformer produces about 2100 volts, and this goes to a doubler with a diode and a high voltage capacitor, typically one micro, and this produces the negative 4 kilovolts for the magnetron and about a kilowatt of input power, which after the losses in the magnetron turns about into 700 watts of microwave power. This is a very typical microwave oven transformer, with the primary, the secondary, the other end is connected to the core and the heater winding. Some of them are a bit different shape, vertically oriented, but otherwise more or less the same. But in some microwave ovens, inverter ones, there is a switching power supply or inverter instead of the iron transformer. It basically contains the ferrite transformer, which is much smaller than the iron one, because it doesn't run at 50 Hz, it runs at a high frequency, several tens of kilohertz, I guess. But it's more complex, it requires some switching transistors and much more control circuitry. I was donated just the power supply, not the entire oven, because it would be a bit harder to shape, of course. But let's explore this power supply. It seems to have this heater connection. These two go to the heater end. There is about 3.15 volts in between of these. But there is also about 4 kilovolts negative in the heater referenced to ground. It seems to have this transformer. Some high voltage diodes, very similar to the traditional ones in most other ovens, but I guess these ones have to be fast diodes, because they rectify a high frequency instead of 50 Hz. And some capacitors, and of course at a higher frequency, the capacitors can be much smaller than the capacitor used at 50 Hz, or 60 in some countries. And it also seems to be some sort of a doubler with two capacitors. In the traditional circuit, there is just one capacitor because it's a doubler with no smoothing. A doubler producing a pulsing voltage. Of course there is some warning. Here's I guess some interference filter inductor. Some film capacitors here. And some optocouplers. This big power resistor. Several more resistors. Here's the bridge rectifier. Some switching transistors. I guess MOSFETs or even more likely IGBT transistors for the power. And there is a lot of control circuitry, especially this chip and some other SMD semiconductors, transistors, smaller chips and a lot of resistors and capacitors. Danger high voltage area. This looks interesting. We will try to reverse engineer at least the power section of it. And it seems this high voltage transformer has the secondary here, which is split into two sections, I guess, to reduce the voltage between the layers of the windings. And here's the primary with not that many turns of a very thick wire, basically a high frequency wire made of multiple thinner ones. Because at this thickness of a wire and a high frequency, if it was a single solid wire, the skin effect would be already a problem. And the transformer has a ferrite core, and I guess some high voltage discharging resistor for the capacitors. It looks like 100 mega ohms, 30 kilovolt rated or something like this. Let's shine some light into it. There are some components under the transformer. And these two switching transistors are not the same. Each of them is different for some reason. Here's the bridge rectifier. And I guess here's the main going in. There might have been some additional interference suppression filter before this. On a different board, which I don't have, but this actually goes straight into the bridge rectifier. And from this one, one of it is probably the negative, which is common and the positive seems to go through this inductor, some additional filtration and then these film capacitors. And there is no electrolytic capacitor, no high capacitance capacitor to smooth the rectified mains, because you don't really need smoothing when you want to turn the energy to heat. A high capacitance smoothing electrolytic capacitor would be just an extra cost, it would take extra space and it would be another failure point. 
because electrolytic capacitors are the least reliable components, but also the only capacitors with a very high capacitance. And also a smoothing at such a high power like 1 kW would cause massive power factor problems. So they are just rectifying the mains but not smoothing it. The entire thing operates at 100 Hz ripple. And these capacitors are low capacitance, they just decouple the high frequency but don't smooth 100 Hz. To smooth a low frequency like 100 Hz you'd need much more capacitance than film capacitors can have. And here's the reverse engineered schematic of the power section of it. Of course it doesn't include the bloody complex control circuitry, controlling the gates of the IGBT transistors and sensing the voltage. And I of course don't have the control panel of the microwave oven and also I guess there was some input board with some fuse, some interference filter and maybe some relay on it. Maybe there was a relay in the way switching this so it's not always on, disconnecting it from a main is in standby, because otherwise this big resistor would always dissipate power. It's a 3.5 kilo ohm 15 watt resistor, basically dropping the voltage from the unsmooth AC to the voltage necessary to power the control circuitry, the control chip and other small components. And in this power section the mains goes through this bridge rectifier, this additional interference suppression inductor, this decoupling but not smoothing capacitor, and then there is a half bridge of IGBT transistors where for some reason each of them is different, and there is a weird wire jumper on the board, not sure it's just a jumper or is it a current sensing resistor? And of course both IGBT transistors have a built-in reverse diode or anti-parallel diode and there is a snubber capacitor, some discharging resistors and the output of the half bridge goes via this DC blocking capacitor into the primary of the big transformer, the high voltage transformer and both terminals of the transformer go through some chain of SMD resistors. They're tiny so they put a lot of them in a series because there is a lot of a voltage and the high voltage secondary goes into a doubler with two capacitors, which again for some reason are slightly different values. They are rated 3 kV. I guess each of them has 2 kV on it because it produces about 4 kV for the magnetron. And the positive terminal of the doubler is grounded and via the metal chassis it's connected to the anode of the magnetron. And the negative of the doubler goes to the heater, which works as also a cathode. And for some reason this diode goes to one terminal of the heater and this capacitor to the other terminal, but it doesn't make much difference because this is just a couple turns and the heater is a very low resistance anyway. Between these terminals there is a negligible voltage, just about 3.3 volts, negligible in comparison to the high voltage between these and this one. And here's the high voltage resistor, discharging resistor for the high voltage capacitors. And of course the magnetron drops about 4 kV and the power supply has to be somehow current limited. The magnetron doesn't regulate its power draw, it always drops about 4 kV no matter the current. I guess the current is regulated using some feedback. Or maybe these capacitors double as a capacitive dropper or the leakage inductance of the transformer also limits the current. Because the windings appear to be loosely coupled. And this is the high voltage secondary and in this narrow slot here is the heater winding, just a couple turns. And of course everybody's screaming try to power it. Well, should I try to power it? It seems like the mains comes in here and there is no complex interconnection to the control panel. The only other cable going to it is this with three wires and it seems to go to a pair of optocouplers. One wire is common and via these optocouplers the front panel and the control panel probably gives it some signals to turn on or to somehow regulate the power. Not sure the power regulation is pulse width modulated or modulated linearly by the current through the optocoupler. Or is it some more complex digital communication here? Of course I can try bring mains voltage into it and then shorting the phototransistors one or the other or both to try to enable it. But of course this is bloody dangerous, it produces multiple kilovolts at quite a high current, couple hundred milliamps at least. I was almost connecting my dodgy test plug to it and plugging it in, but then I thought maybe let's measure the transistors in it first. Maybe the transistors are the reason the oven was disassembled and measuring emitter to collector and it shows a zero voltage drop for this one and the other one. Emitter to collector virtually zero. In a good IGBT transistor with a built-in anti-parallel diode it basically see this diode voltage drop about a half a volt or something and even measuring the output of the bridge rectifier actually shows virtually a short circuit. So unfortunately no I'm not plugging this thing in. Maybe the transistors failed by themselves. Of course when one transistor fails in a half bridge it causes a short, of course put it upside down, 
When a shorter transistor always destroys the other one, when the other one tries to turn on into a short circuit, basically. Of course, the transistors can fail on their own, or because of some overvoltage or spike coming from the main, or maybe the high voltage transformer shorted internally, developed short turns. Let's try to ring test it, showing zero rings, but of course now it's connected to the shorted transistors, disconnecting one of the primary terminals. And now the primary of the transformer shows about 26 rings, so the transformer is not bad. It's kind of useless without the switching transistors and the control circuitry anyway. Out of curiosity, can I ring test the secondary of it? This is one terminal, this is the other terminal. And showing about 12 rings, so the secondary can be also ring tested. And of course this high voltage switching power supply is definitely not easily reusable as a high voltage power supply for other purposes like for spark gap tesla coil. Even if it was working, it's sort of fragile and easy to damage, so it cannot replace a traditional microwave oven transformer for very use high voltage experiments. A microwave oven transformer is not as easy to damage as a switching power supply, but still not continuously short circuit proof, maybe for 10, 20 or 30 seconds. But of course I very strongly recommend you not to do this because it's extremely dangerous. The output voltage is over 2 kV, about 2100 volts, and the short circuit current can be about 2 amps, as you can see here. And of course the magnetic field of the transformer is influencing the clamp meter, but I definitely don't play with microwave oven transformers unless you're absolutely sure what you're doing. And entirely at your own risk and responsibility. Now it seems to be influenced a bit less. Can you imagine this sort of current going through your body? Touching this would be way worse than touching minus voltage because at minus voltage even the worst case resistance of your body still limits the current to several times less than this. I guess at minus voltage you never get about 2 amps through your body. They typically say the worst case resistance of a human body is about 1500 ohms, and of course the worst is the lowest here, and this limits at minus voltage the current to about 153 milliamps, which would be about 0.15 ohms. And this is already quite lethal, but you have some chance of survival. But when you touch the secondary of a microwave oven transformer, let's actually try to do a calculation. Let's say the voltage is 2100 volts and we don't know the impedance of the transformer, which contributes to the current limitation, but we know the output current in a short circuit was about 2.1 ohms. And this conveniently gives the impedance of the transformer as 1000 ohms. And let's add the impedance of human body or resistance of human body. And let's calculate how much current would actually go through the stupid guy playing with a microwave oven transformer. And it would be about 0 0.84 amps. But it can get even worse because the higher the voltage, the more your skin is basically turning into carbon, getting completely burned and reducing its resistance. So the actual resistance of your body can be less than 1500 ohms at higher voltages than minus. Now your survival chances are quite slim. You'll be actually dissipating about one kilowatt. And of course this simple simulation ignores the fact that the impedance of the transformer is partially resistive but also partially inductive. But this fact might actually make the worst case current even worse. So definitely don't do what I'm showing. Instead of it just play with my online calculator or calculator as I call it. And some other sources say the human body resistance for minus voltage is about 1000 ohms and at a high voltage about 500 ohms. But of course this depends on many factors. Electrical safety is a very complex topic and I can't cover it in a couple minutes. And these calculations are very simplified and I know it and don't attack me for this. I'm just trying to show some scary ballpark numbers to discourage people from roasting themselves with high voltage. So be careful with these. They already have some victims and I call them the most dangerous components you can take from any common household appliances. And you don't even have to touch it to get a shock. And this voltage can break down the insulation or you can get into the way of the discharge. And its switching equivalent is quite interesting. I'm curious what the operating frequency and is the power frequency modulated or pulse width modulated? It would be interesting to see how its behavior changes with the different power settings of the microwave oven. But not having the rest of the microwave oven and the module being faulty, this reverse engineered schematic is probably the best I can do in this video. Maybe I could look at the marking of the chip and 
See some data sheet of it. It does have some marking on it. Looks like 919 C4536. I tried to search for this type number, but it gives no results. And each of the IGBT transistors seem to have two packages, 3 pin and 5 pin next to it, probably for gate drive. Is there any readable marking on it? And that's about all I can tell about this module. So that's it, and if you like my videos, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon, using the thanks button and subscribing. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. You keep this channel running.